Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Health Science Highway event, where we learn more about the pharmaceutical sciences. Center for Excellence in Education is a nonprofit founded in 1983 by Joanne De Janeiro and Admiral Rickover, who's father of the nuclear Navy, and civilian uses of nuclear power with a mission to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence and leadership in STEM. You can go to our website, the links are in the chat where you can learn more about the programs that we have for teachers and students. Um, we have the Research Science Institute, USABO, our USA BioLympiad, the Teacher Enrichment Program, which is hosting the event today, TEP, and our new program, which is called STEM Lyceums. My name is Laura Ashley, and I am a program manager at CEE, and I will be hosting today's event. I am pleased to have two wonderful speakers for today's event. We have Dr. Sarah Ying, who works in clinical development at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Um, a little bit about her. She has 10 years of experience in pharmaceutical clinical development and currently volunteers at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. She will share an overview of the pharmaceutical development process, highlight the various roles in that process, and also discuss her work on rare diseases. We also have Dr. Edgar F. Talbot III, and he is an assistant professor of pharmacy practice at the Appalachian College of Pharmacy. He worked, has worked seven years as a retail pharmacist and also conducted cardiac and pulmonary rehab counseling for Rock Castle Regional Hospital. So I am going to begin today's event by turning it over to Dr. Ying, who will share a little bit about what she does and her journey in the pharmaceutical sciences. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for um, inviting me to talk today. RSI was a huge um, influence in my development and and you know, I guess is what started me on this highway. And um, so I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about that. And so, um, and what I'll be talking to you a little bit about is sort of like my role, which has been in, in specifically in clinical development, but I'll tell you a little bit about drug development in general, but what I'll really focus on is, is emphasizing sort of like what parts of sort of like my STEM, background actually led me to this point and um and hopefully maybe others amongst you will will will, will see see the same as well okay so really what's most important is like trying to decide for yourself what is really most important to you and you know obviously that's different for everybody and if you look around if you look at the tallest buildings in the world they all have the word financial, commercial in it. And so that's what's important to a lot of people, but it wasn't always that way. And so for hundreds of years, the tallest building in the world was the Cathedral Notre Dame, Strasbourg. You know, religion was really important to people. And if you go to Switzerland, the building that is the tallest in the country doesn't make any of these lists of the, the tallest buildings in the world, but is the pharmaceutical towers in Basel. And so let's let's take a look at why they thought that was important enough to make that their tallest building and and see if this could potentially play a role in your life. So, on the um on the highway, I wonder if I can move myself aside cuz am am I are part of my slides being blocked by these Okay, you can see the entire slide. Okay. So this is just for me. Perfect. So, um um, so developing new drugs for medical treatment is really, really important. And, and so that's, that's a major area of the, of the pharmaceutical sciences. We'll hear, we'll be hearing about different aspects of it, but, you know, clinical development and, um, and, you know, al along that highway, you know, what small role can clinical development play? And, um, and, and that's what I'll talk to you about today. So first of all, the background is my STEM story. And so I didn't start out as somebody who wanted to go into drug development, who thought that I was going to cure the world. Well, maybe I thought that there would be some, some science involved and I would cure. Well, well, I was trying to decide between aging or blindness. But most of all, I was just a regular kid who liked math. I went to 
summer camps that all had three letters. I went to CTY, I went to OSU, I went to RSI. And everybody around me loved math, adored science, and knew that they were going to change the world in that way. And so, um, and it was a little bit funny because when I, um, I heard from CEE about talking um, ab about the pharmaceutical science, I'm like, but nobody goes into that. And then I realized, well, I did, and I love it. So maybe somebody else will do that. Will 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 we'll also love it. And so, so where I went is, I, I started out with a very very standard scientific background. I did science fairs. I did math competitions. When I went to college, I majored in biochemistry, and um, and then I went straight to medical school. And where, where I was sure that I was, again, I had no thoughts of going into um, drug development. Everybody was interested in academia. And I knew I was going to um, do, be a clinician scientist. I knew I was gonna get involved in research. And um, I, I studied, I focused in neurology. I did my residency in neurology. I did a fellowship after fellowship in neuro-ophthalmology, neuro-otology, internal medicine, and um, just really getting all that training. The first time I actually got an actual, um, the first time I was actually gainfully employed was at age 33 after completing all of my training when I finally got a junior faculty position at a university. But all that time, what was most really important is is how science fit into everything and how there was scientific underpinnings behind um behind behind everything that you did and one of the things that was sort of interesting is that math that was so important to me growing up seemed to have disappeared you know you give some you know you have a human body you add a mole of of normal saline and you know another mold of normal saline and your 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 sodium is still the same at the end because there's all this homeostasis that's going on behind behind the um the scenes and um and so really there was no no true numerical calculation or so i thought but then what i think really carried me through was um meeting up with the engineers and finding that interface between medicine and engineering um which brought my scientific sensibilities um together with the clinical sensibilities that i was picking up in medical school and it was sort of at that interface that i found the computational approach to medicine and whether it was um doing quantitative measurement of eye movements as an indicator of, of brain activity or um, working together with electrical and computer engineers to de develop automated image processing algorithms for um, um, rec image recognition in MRIs of the cerebellum. It was a really um, sort of satisfying way and a really unique way because most of the people who worked in neurology did not work together um, with the with engineers, and a lot of engineers didn't work with physicians. So being at um, at a place where biomedical engineering was really really important was was really fundamental to um, sort of advancing a, a certain area of science. And one of the things that I did was I I studied patients who had. Um, neurodegenerative disease and specifically inherited uh, cerebellar degeneration. This leads to um, cerebellar ataxia, which is in an in coordination that you have um, that um, develops over time. And But one of the things that was really, really important about the work that we did is in one of the subtypes, for example, spinocerebellar ataxia type 6, shown down here, SCA6, one of the things that we found was that there was a very, very specific structure-function relationship um, so that if there was a, um, if, if, if there was a atrophy or a degeneration, one particular part of brain that, that was more more pronounced than in other regions of the brain, it could it could lead directly to symptomatology that you see. And so that um, and then so being able to characterize the disease more closely was heavily dependent on having these computational methods. And it was something that was um, 
that was incredibly rewarding and even more so I found um, in an area that I had not considered before in high school because I had never been exposed to it. And that was the patient contact part. And the one thing that I found was that when I was with um, patients, this was the one time in my life that people actually listened to what I had to say during a lecture. Um, and, you know, sometimes you talk to physicians about um, but computer science, they're, they're not really listening, and sometimes the other way around. But when people are really listening to every single word because it means their life, you have to work just a little bit harder. But then there came a point in my life where I realized that this is, these diseases were progressing, even though they were slowly progressing disease, progressive diseases, they were progressing too fast. Suddenly, I was attending the funerals of my patients. And I realized that it was time that I had to do something. And so that's when I entered the pharma world when I said, okay, all the work that I've been doing up to this time has been diagnostic. It hasn't been therapeutic. Um, how can I have a direct impact in the life other than the appreciation that they have for the fact that somebody understood their system, their, 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 um, their disease, even though um, even though there wasn't um, a treatment for it. And so I went into the pharma industry knowing that there weren't going to be any treatments for rare diseases because people don't pay attention to rare diseases because where the bottom line matters, you know, the, for the first, one of the first lines that I encountered when I entered the pharma industry was, you know, if you're not gonna make a billion dollars, why even bother? And, and, you know, and, 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 Thankfully, that's not that's no longer true because there's been a, a lot of legislation um, that that's encouraging the use of new drugs, and so I, I want to say thank you and want to encourage the community out there to continue to support these um, the support of rare diseases because you know it it might not af affect a million people or make a billion dollars, but if it affects your life, it's really, really important. So once I was in the pharm pharmaceutical industry, you know, I found that even though these, these were not the standard, um, I had not followed sort of like the standard pathway, there, were, there was a lot of room to use the skills that I had developed in academia. So I was in a division of computational neuromedicine and human biology, um, where we tried to look for ways to measure disease. And then I was in New Frontier Science, where we looked for ways of partnering with um, academic institutions to find those, those, those small experiments that could use just a little bit more support that pot could potentially find us a, a new way to approach um, um, therapeutics. And then, and then finally, I, I, I took several roles um, in clinical, directly in clinical development. And I'll tell you a little bit more about um, the possibilities in the pharma industry. So what is clinical development? So the, the standard drug development pathway, I'll, I'll focus on um, the clinical research part, but you know, I'll mention a little bit about discovery and development. That's what's d done a lot in NIH before we go. Th th there's the preclinical pre research that's necessary to vet the drugs before we hit the cl clinical research phase, before we can um, think even about um, asking the FDA for a final approval to bring it to the, um, the general populace. So in the discovery phase, now this is a standard area where a lot of people with um, um, may, may have found themselves who have been in the STEM fields. Um, and these are the basic science um, approaches that are often supported by the NIH and, and, and other governmental in institutions. So, but this is key for generating the ideas. Is, are there, through your basic research, can you develop new insights into a disease process? Or maybe, or maybe as a clinician, or have you made some observations? Are there unanticipated effects of your treatment in, um, in your patients? Or maybe you're directly looking for, um, for potential compounds be, and, by, and you may be screening several 
or, or hundreds of compounds in a, a higher throughput method? Are you looking for a compound who, which has the mechanism of, of action that you're looking for? Or are you developing new technologies such as that, that can help perhaps with delivering a medication to the desired target to a specific tissue, a particular area of the body? Um, or is it, are you manipulating genes? All of these um, basic discoveries are, are, are well-known and, and are very, very exciting ideas. Um, but the one thing that, that people don't really realize is that this is just the start. Once, once you come up with a great idea, um, there's, there's a long road ahead of you. And so there's, there's still the development. Once you've hit upon a potential candidate, there's, you still need to understand, well, what is the, you know, exactly how you're going to administer it? Like, what is the dosage that you need? What really is the mechanism that we're affecting? What is the, um, what, what are the pharmacokinetics? Like, how does this, um, how is this drug metabolized? How does it behave in the body? And then how does it interact with different um, populations or other treatments that a patient may actually be getting in real life? Um, how does it compare to other treatments that are there? And, and, and most of all, is it safe? Like, are there potential toxicities? There's so many drugs that we know about that, that really seem to have so much promise and, you know, and very, very famously are just taken off the market, you know, and whether it's um, DES, you know, decades ago, or um, COX-2 inhibitors, every, every, every drug, that that works, you know, has has a potential side effect, and we just need to balance the the risks and the benefits, and then so all of this needs needs to be um, developed before we know we start we can start to develop candidates to move ahead. Now, and some of this can also be done in academia, and 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 particularly people who have an, a, a desire to bring bring medications forward may work in this area. Then is the true preclinical research area, and this is mostly taken over by by the by the pharma and the biotech companies, where they start to do in vitro and vivo experiments that that really help us to to um, to define uh, to to properly test the ideas that have have come before, and you know is how does it work? Is it safe? And and can these and can, most of all, can these um, experiments be replicated reliably? And so often these are done in, in multiple labs, in multiple models, in vitro, in vivo, under very, very strictly regulated conditions, none of which would be done in an academic setting, and, 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 and none of which... In, would would be necessarily wel as welcome in the higher profile journals that we like to publish in, because um, a lot of this this work is considered confirmatory. But it's but it's critical to move forward. So once the drug makes it past the preclinical stage, then we can start to think. To, um, from the clinical research standpoint, and this is where 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 I start to get involved, um, is is study design. For, first of all, we have to decide how do we select which patients are we going to test this out on? Which patients are these uh, most most suited for? How are we going to design a control group? What is the most um, what is the proper control group, and and what is the proper um, um, placebo type control, nothing at all, um, or, or is there a control treatment that we could compare that to? What exactly is the type of dose and what is the route of administration that we would use for that individual? Um, and then, and then what, what are the mo ideal clinical assessments and outcome measures, which are very tricky because, because you know, well, are they going to, um, have an effect size that we're going to see in a reasonable amount of time? How can we get sort of a quick answer to know if we need to move ahead with, with, this, with this drug? Um, what, what, is, what is going to be meaningful? What is going to be clinically meaningful? So there's, there's a lot of nuance that goes into the development of a study design, um, particularly um, as, as we move 
and 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 I and through my work in the rare diseases, one of the things that's incredibly difficult is you don't have the large populations available. So how can we be cleverer to get a better answer from less information? So this helps us to develop an actual timeline for the study design. Okay, if we if we administer, how many doses are we going to administer? At what time do we need to stop? Consult with our data safety monitoring um, boards. Um, how do we how do we divide it up? We we're not going to give it to all the uh, patients right up front. Maybe we want to just test it in in one or two patients. Make sure it's okay before. Um, in the, the, in, in that smaller group before moving on to the larger group. And then so once we we developed a timeline, started, you know, recruited the sites, started recruiting patients, then we need to um, be collecting information on each individual. And there's hundreds and hundreds of pages of information for each individual. And there may be many, many patients to go through. And so this is this is the one of the most important parts of of the the drug development, which is just absolutely safety. Front and center is safety. You do not um, because this is the first time. Um, it may have been that this particular compound may have been administered, or maybe it's the first time in this particular population. All of this, the reason we're doing a clinical trial is because it's new and we don't understand it. And we need to make sure that we first do no harm. And, and one of the interesting things about looking at all these data is that you're going through these data carefully. And, and you, while you're looking for these safety signals and you're also looking at the class, clinical assessments in order to remain impartial, you are, are typically masked to the status of the, of the individual. So you don't know if that person received a treatment or if that person was in the control group. And, but you just have to stop and look at and ass assess the data and just make sure that there isn't something going on that you need to look into a little bit more, more closely. Then finally, when, when, when the study is through, then you can, um, and, and perhaps at, at strategic points along the way, then you can do a true statistical assessment of, of, the, of your drug, hopefully compared to um, your control. Is there an effect that you see? And is there some sort of a dose response such, such that, 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 that further suggests that the intervention that you've made is making a difference? So um, I'm I'm looking at the time, and and what I'll do is I'll just go quickly through um, the the um, the various phases of clinical research that's that's necessary for um, approval of the drug by the FDA phase one safety um, and and dosage um, where we look at it, sometimes we start with with a lot of drugs we may start with healthy volunteers or if we're um, or sometimes we may start with patients, but this is really a small study, maybe lasting several months, just to make sure that just um, just trying this drug without knowing if it's having an effect at all is 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 it safe enough to actually try in a larger population? Seventy percent of drugs make it through this 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 phase, and that number is actually much less in neurological disease. I'm sorry to say. Um, phase two, efficacy and safety. This is really to prove that, uh, just just give us con confidence that there's, and we we call this proof of concept, um, that that we we think this is actually working in some way, shape, or form. You know, here where we're really trying the medications in patients, we may have several hundred patients. The duration may be it's it's usually brief, it may be from months to years, depending on, on how long you need to observe the effect or what the um, treatment size is and, and, how, and what our recruitment capabilities are. And then suddenly, you know, we're dropping off only a third of these, make it through then to the next phase, phase three. Now, this is the big, the big, big clinical trial, efficacy and safety. This is where you try it in a large scale population where you feel that you're, um, you have the statistical numbers, you're, you're, you're statistically powered to show the difference that you're looking for. 
is this actually working? You've you've looked at it and you you knew it was safe enough to move into a larger pa patient. You convinced yourself that it, it seems to have some sort of effect and now you want to demonstrate it. You're going to need 300 to 3,000 patients. It, it, you may the, the study may last any from from one to four years. And um, and this is sort of like the big study. O again, only a quarter of the patients of, of the of the drugs make it to through through approval, and then after which there may be a phase four study um, that that continues to observe safety and efficacy after approval. Now, one of the things, as you can imagine, this is this. This structure was set up by the FDA, and 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 they they come in and while they're there, they're every step of the way looking between every phase, sort of like the the two um, major major milestones that you hear about, um, are one is when when you've passed the preclinical um, stage and you. Um, you're, you're awarded an investigational new drug approval, and then which allows you to start the studies and then making through. And by the time you're done with phase three, you'll make it to, um, you, you can put in your new, your NDA or your new drug application. But these numbers, while 70, 30, 30, that may, may not sound that bad. Um, when you, when you look at, um, when you multiply them out, that actually turns out to be only six or seven percent of drugs that make it through the pipeline. And again, as I mentioned, it's, it's even worse for neurological disease, and it can take from two to eight years. Now, I want to point out what a remarkable achievement it was for the COVID vaccines making it through. What, what was that? December when they found the disease. January, some the the um, scientists sharing their information. Um, you know, released the uh, the sequences, and then August. So compare that to two to eight years for a drug that's already gotten its IND and has already made it past the preclinical phase. It's 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 pretty incredible. So a day in the life, you know, um, it's beyond the core team. You're interacting with people all over the um. um all over the institution, outside of the institution, you know, wh whether they're like internal stakeholders, external st stakeholders, study investigators, you're reviewing documents, reviewing data, um, you're looking for new opportunities that maybe your company might pursue, um, you might be um, um, interacting with regulatory agencies, looking looking for new outcome measures, or, or I I even interacting with patient groups. No two days are alike, it's always, there, it's always very exciting. There's always something new happening. And then, but then looking at sort of um, pharma versus academic translational medicine, um, that's sort of a, a topic I'm looking at the time. That's that's a longer topic that we could have for for another day. But but really, it's it's sort of one of these things where I, I see them as working really, really well together. There's a lot of, um, while, while a, a lot of, a lot of times they're viewed as being quite separate. There's actually a lot of in, um, interaction and cross fertilization that can occur. And then, so to talk a little bit about the STEM skills and knowledge, um, I think I think going back and and looking back, I'm really really grateful for my STEM experience because because of the basic skills that I learned. And you know, one of the key things that is sort of uncelebrated in the pharma world is actually having a number sense. And that's actually just being able to wade through um, reams and reams and reams of data and being able to understand what we, um, not only from a statistical standpoint, but but really to understand what that really means, and having the experience in the real world, um, observing patients and understanding what it means in a patient's life to understand what's what's really there. I think being able to um, it's it's a privilege to be able to work with translational science, and it's and and in in although this is something that I did a lot in academia, I'm like, okay, well, how can we take the, the techniques that we've developed and apply them to patient care. This is sort of like the ultimate form in a being able to help help patients. Um, I think one of the things that's really important um, from academia is is really sort of getting to the the, the bottom line. Um, and 
really understanding what's going on. Um, lots of times, um, if as the scientist in a group, if you're if you're in a group of of individuals who are more on the business side, you know, and then they they're they they have they have different priorities. They have different. Um, um, they're beholden to um, to different interests, and 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 you're there to bridge that between the the various um, shareholders and the stakeholders, and and but but most of all, the one thing that I learned most from medicine was how to understand people, because if you don't, because in medicine, if you don't understand where they're coming from, and they don't understand where you're coming from. They're not going to do anything you tell them to do, no matter how smart you are or how right you are. And so, um, it's that um, connection I think that is is in the end the most important thing. So, in the end, it's all about the people. You want to um, listen to what people are telling you. You want to listen to what people are telling you, and most of all, listen to yourself in deciding what you want to do. So. What teachers can do is really just encourage students to pursue their interests and not necessarily set them on a path, but ask them, help them to find themselves, to find what's true to them. And they will find that wherever they go, that is a part of them and that can guide you. And so um, thank you for listening. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. I don't know if they, they're, they're meant to be now or at the end, but yeah. we can do that now. Thank you so much, Dr. Yang. That was, that was really informative. And I have like two follow-up points. I used to teach, I'm a former chemistry teacher. So I love that you said number sense, because when I would teach dimensional analysis mm -hmm. and all my students would be like, why are we learning this? And I would be like, ah, if you only knew, but um, it helps a lot. So I, I love that you mentioned that. And I also think it's cool because last month for one of uh, CE's events, um, the topic was genomics. So we had two STEM professionals that worked in genomics and they touched on um, the, the science behind, you know, figuring out what drugs work, you know, for certain populations and why they might not work for certain populations. So it's really cool to overlap, like that inter, um, the, I don't even know the word I'm thinking of, but everything like, you know, the interdisciplinary nature of STEM. So I, I think that's wonderful that you touched on that. I appreciate it. Um, we do have two, actually, I think it's just one, but they're kind of related. And you did touch a little bit on how um, the drug uh, development process and how COVID, um, you know, that was sped up, the COVID vaccine, you know, was sped up through that. But the question is, I think it applies, so I'll ask it and then you know, you can answer that as briefly as you want to, but it says, if it takes a few years for clinical trials, how was the COVID vaccine placed on the market for you so quickly? Is it because it was needed as an emergency vaccine? That was, that was 100% your government at work. Um, and, 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 and absolutely it was everybody, it's, it's an example of everybody pulling together when there's a need at hand and then then people are, are are willing to sort of take a risk um, because you know they did the studies. They were excited by the findings. You know, it worked much, honestly, much better than a lot of people expected. Um, people weren't quite sure um, that it was going to work. It was a new technology, and it was it was exciting. It was timely, and it was sort of like to the credit of the. Um, sort of the governmental agencies for sort of al allowing it to go through and while still trying to impose, you know, it, sufficient oversight to continue to examine. And so um, some of the things that you don't really see happening behind the scenes, I have no personal knowledge of any of this, but one of the things that was sort of noticeable is that for, for some, you know, for some age groups, it rolled out quickly. For other age groups, you know, there was, there was, there was a little bit of a, a pause, and it wasn't just when the um, when the studies were complete, and then, but it was it was the the numbers came out, and the approval didn't come, and so you knew that they it merited a second look. But I mean, I think the the whole COVID um, procedure, I think, is 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 very illustrative of the fact that you start with. 
the most urgent need um and then and then you you roll it out in phases they started with the very oldest most at risk people and then and then they went down through the age groups and and because they're, they're actually very careful about their studies as they get into children because um the the, the physiology is perhaps is 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 changing and it may be different and so they need to examine that separately so it's it's everybody's gotten involved in drug development over the past couple of years um personally yes thank you dr ying um if you all have any more questions for dr ying you can feel free to put them in the q a function and if any come up um later on in the in the presentation um after dr Talbot presents then we can come back to those but Thank you again, Dr. Ying. I uh, really appreciate your, your talk. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to Dr. Edgar Talbot, Talbot III, um, and he um, will share his STEM journey and a little bit about pharmaceutical sciences. I want to talk a little bit about uh, my journey to becoming a pharmacist, a PharmD, maybe give you some reasons why you might steer your interested uh, students into a doctor of pharmacy program. Uh, look at different career paths for pharmacists. It's not just retail pharmacy. Uh, get in a little plug for Appalachian College of Pharmacy, uh, where I went to school and actually teach here now. And maybe uh, some steps that you can take interested students to steer them toward the door of pharmacy school, some things you can do. Um, there's the topics of discussion. Here's a couple pictures from our uh, campus here at ACP. I took last year, last fall. So my journey to becoming a pharmacist, uh, lots of twists and turns in this particular journey. Uh, I was I'm a, I'm a hospital. I was in high school, I was probably about a junior in high school when I had this crazy idea, I wanna drive a nuclear submarine. I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So obviously that's, that's a lot of math, a lot of science I had to get involved with. So uh, I basically signed up for my AP physics and AP chemistry and all those good things in high school because I knew uh, I needed those things to drive a nuclear submarine. I needed to become an officer. So I had to go to college to become an officer. So then I decided, so I needed to get a scholarship to go to college. So I started looking at the Navy. Uh, ROTC program. So I uh, signed up for ROTC scholarship, got it. Uh, then I combined submarines and ROTC and I came up with Virginia Military Institute. So I went to a military college, four-year school. I have a degree in physics. This was a long time ago. It's 1986, graduated VMI. Uh, got out of VMI, uh, went to, and actually got to drive a nuclear submarine. About two years later, I became officer deck on the SS, SSBN Simon Boulevard, the SSBN 641. Uh, made about five patrols, spent a year of my life underwater, uh, got out of the Navy after about six years, went to work as an engineer at Newport News Shipbuilding. We were building the fast attack nuclear submarines out there at Newport News. Uh, did that for about six years. There's, there's kind of a trend here. I was changing jobs like every six. Uh, actually became a librarian after that. I got into work. I actually ran the computer system for one of our local library systems. Uh, then I got into computers in the IT field after that for a few years. And then at age 42, I decided to go back to pharmacy school. And I actually came to back to my hometown, which is uh, Grundy, Virginia, and went to the Appalachian College of Pharmacy. I, I'm a 2009 graduate. So a few years back, I graduated pharmacy school, got a PharmD degree. Uh, then my wife decided she wanted to go get her PhD. So we were at the University of Kentucky. She picked up her master's and PhD in, in English out there at the University of Kentucky in the Lexington, Kentucky area. And I worked as a retail pharmacist out there for about seven years. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that later on about working as a retail pharmacist. Uh, about six years ago, I had the opportunity to come back to my hometown, back to Appalachian College of Pharmacy. I've been teaching here for about six years now. So what does my job look like here at ACP? Uh, basically, I'm assistant professor. I coordinate a couple of clinical skills courses in our second year or our P2 year. Uh, I oversee the simulation lab. That's a picture of me at the, in our simulation lab. We've got like a $100,000 mannequin, we can pretty much simulate any kind of medical condition, any kind of drug-drug interaction, uh, we can simulate on this mannequin. I also teach in uh, classes that uh, involving cardiology, uh, pulmonology, uh, teaching the psych course. Uh, I also teach drug information and in particular the biostatistics. So we're very math heavy there. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are a lot of hats here, we're a small college, so I'm also director of our PICS program. A big part of our mission statement is giving back to the community. So we have our students actually volunteer over 100 hours in the community to, to give back to our communities. And we'll talk about that here in Appalachia. And I'm also the COVID-19 quarter. That's been 
COVID, COVID-19 coordinator. That's been a lot of fun for the last couple of years. So some reasons to become a farm D. Uh, real quick, you know, we engage in direct patient care. Uh, we want to help others. Uh, we're one of the most accessible health professionals. If you think about it, you know, how much time do you spend with your MD? How much time do you spend with your healthcare provider, your dentist? If you think about it, you probably spend more time talking with your local pharmacist than you do any one of the professions over the course of a year. Uh, we're a member of a healthcare team. Uh, we've got a lot of different career paths that you can maybe steer your, your STEM students towards. Uh, we have job stability, mobility, and flexibility. We'll talk about those. Uh, pretty good earning potential and a pretty good work-life balance also. And again, uh, you know, one of the most trusted professions. I kind of got, got out of retail pharmacy. One good thing about retail pharmacy is, is when you go home, you go home. When you get in academia or, or if you're a, prof or a professor or if you're teaching high school, when you go home, you go home to grade papers and everything else. Everybody knows that. So we are considered the medication experts. Uh, we want the best outcomes for our patient with the correct drug therapy. And we always look for the right drug, the right dose, the right duration of that dose, uh, the right dosage forms. And we collaborate a lot with physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers. Either if we're working in a hospital, that's even on a healthcare team, or even in retail pharmacy. There was not a single day that I worked for seven years as a retail pharmacist that I didn't I pick up the phone and call a physician and say, you know, are you sure about this dose for this seven-year-old? Are you sure about increasing this dose for Ms. Jones for her hypertension medication? And most times the, the physician, the healthcare provider would, would agree with me and they would actually make a change on, over the phone. Uh, and then we'll give you the practice in a wide variety of settings. We'll talk about that. So first off, community pharmacy. This is the, what everybody thinks of when they think of a, of a pharmacist. And really about 60% of pharmacists go into health community pharmacy. Um, this can include the big, big chains, like uh, you know, Walmart, CVS, Walgreens, things like that, as well as the small town pharmacies. Now, I, when I worked retail pharmacy, I was a small town pharmacist, a little town called Mount Vernon, Kentucky, just south of Lexington, Kentucky. And I worked seven years as a retail pharmacist. And we get to know our patients. We're dealing with our patients on a, on a daily basis. So if you have students that like to communicate with people, that like to help people, that like to talk to, talk to people, uh, this may be a good field for you. Um, again, we, we get to know our patients and they learn, they learn to trust us as, their, as one of their healthcare providers. Uh, hospital pharmacy, about 25% of pharmacists go into hospital. Um, and again, uh, they work a wide variety of jobs and we'll talk about a lot of these. Uh, they can be a very small hospital, one or two pharmacists, all the way up to one of our local hospitals is pictured in the lower right-hand corner, that's uh, Pikeville Medical Center. They have about 23 pharmacists on staff, so they really get to specialize there. And, they, and they, some of them are working on like high-tech robot, robotic pharmacies that are actually uh, helping dispense some of these medications. A uh, smaller part of pharmacists, uh, and again, these are all careers that you may steer some of your STEM toward students toward that are interested in pharmacy. It's compounding pharmacy. Two to three percent of uh, pharmacists are compounding pharmacies. Roughly about five percent of all uh, Prescriptions actually need to be compound. Uh, so you have to be good at math. You have to be, uh, are you a good cook? Uh, you know, preparing the medications, things like that. You have to follow a very strict recipe. You know, we're kind of a zero defect uh, profession. You know, we can't, I always say that working retail pharmacy is kind of like working fast food, except if you give mustard instead of mayonnaise, you might hurt somebody. So it's kind of a zero defect uh, profession. Uh, veterinary pharmacy, we have students that uh, are steered toward, steered toward, they love animals, they want to go into veterinary pharmacy. Uh, and it could be uh, typically larger animal hospitals, uh, schools of veterinary science typically have a pharmacist on staff. So if you want to go into academia and you love animals, this may be a career path for you. Uh, some pharmacists work with just large animals out in the Lexington, Kentucky area, you know, where I work retail pharmacy. I know there was some pharmacists that worked out there that did nothing but horses. And they were working on multi-million dollar racehorses out in Kentucky. Uh, another area of pharmacy is, is, is primary care pharmacists. So we're working alongside you know, physicians and nurses on these medical care teams. Uh, I've known some physicians that would not work for a clinic or a hospital that didn't have a pharmacist as part of their healthcare teams. You know, the, the healthcare providers were saying, hey, I, I'm the di I diagnose disease. I don't have time to learn every, all the aspects of everything about every medication. I'm going to leave that up to the pharmacist to handle that. 
Uh, so we do a lot of counseling to patients. Uh, believe it or not, we're starting to become providers in a lot of areas. I know the VA medical system, uh, pharmacists are already providers. You know, we, we write scripts, we fill, we fill scripts, we change uh, dosages, things like that. And it's starting to bleed out into uh, the, the, the rest of the profession itself. We work under collaborative practice agreements under a physician where we actually take over and manage diabetes. We manage hypertension. We manage, manage cholesterol in patients. And we actually found out that pharmacists do a pretty good job of it. And we're seeing that, and we get better results at lowering blood sugars and lowering cholesterol than if you just send them home with the medication without, without a pharmacist. Involved. Pediatric pharmacy is another area you might get into if you love working with kids. Uh, cardiology pharmacy, here's one of those uh, uh, small areas that, that, that you can get into in some larger healthcare systems. Um, so one of the things that I got to do when I worked retail pharmacy, it was a small, uh, small community pharmacy, but we were owned by a hospital. So the hospital let me come in you know, about half a day a week, and I worked with the cardiac and pulmonary rehab uh, program. So basically what that was was uh, if somebody had a heart attack, somebody had a major exacerbation of their COP, they couldn't breathe. Uh, rather than just what we've done in the past, you, you know, you write them some scripts, give them a new inhaler, uh, you send them home and say, you know, Miss Jones, you know, try to try to watch what you eat, try to get some exercise, try to walk, you know, and that we weren't seeing good results with that. So we, we developed these cardiac and pulmonary rehab programs. We actually have a pharmacist come in and talk to them about their medications, show them how to use their inhaler. Uh, 50 percent uh, uh, of all inhaler use in the U.S. is there's at least one step that's incorrect. So that, that's billions of dollars lost in inhalers every year in the U.S. Uh, we had dietitians come in and say, you know, Ms. Jones, we want to show you how to cook. We want to show you how to buy food at the local grocery store. Uh, we had uh, uh, physical therapists come in. We actually put them on cardiac monitors, and we would have them come in and walk the treadmill. And we worked them out hard, believe it or not. We put them through it. I mean, we worked them until they almost dropped. And these were, these were heart attack patients and COPD patients. And we had them in there two or three times a week for, for 12 weeks. But I would see miracles happen over the course of those 12 weeks. Uh, somebody who couldn't, could barely walk across the room uh, without being exhausted at the end of those 12 weeks was walking laps around the hospital. And that was just having this, this, this concentrated program uh, for rehabilitation. Uh, research pharmacists, you can get into things like Dr. Ying was talking about, uh, research for government, uh, working for pharmaceutical companies, developing new drugs, uh, Johnson Johnson, Merck, uh, Pfizer, companies like that. Infectious disease pharmacists, there are in, in bigger hospitals. You can become the infectious disease pharmacist, uh, the infectious disease expert. I did two rotations at Pikeville Medical Center, and there was a guy there named Steve Barger, and I actually did an infectious disease rotation under him. He was the guy that people went to. The doctors came to him when they couldn't figure out what was wrong with the patient. He was like Dr. House, I guess, is what you'd call him. Um, and a lot of times the physicians wouldn't know how to treat a particular uh, disease or if they couldn't figure out a particular infection, they would write antibiotics for pharmacists on the chart and it was up to the barber to come in and actually order the labs, uh, figure out what kind of bug it was, order the medications, order the right doses, order the right follow-up labs. So he was pretty much handling infectious disease at Pikeville Medical Center. Uh, critical care pharmacists in other areas students might want to get into. Uh, if you like working with the very sickest of patients in the ICU setting, uh, a lot of those are filling up now, obviously, with COVID patients, with uh, COVID wards. Uh, nutrition support pharmacists. Uh, we have pharmacists that do nothing but nutrition at a hospital, especially the larger hospitals. Now, obviously, if a patient's unconscious, if uh, they can't swallow, then they still have, they have, still have to be fed, right? So what is the best mix of IV medications for that particular disease state, uh, for the carbohydrates, for the proteins? Uh, what's their kidney function? Can they handle a certain amount of proteins? Are they a burn victim? Uh, basically, does anything interact with medications they're taking? Are they a heart failure patient? We won't, don't want to fluid overload those patients. There's a lot of stuff involved in just feeding patients in a hospital. And pharmacists get involved in putting those together. Uh, military pharmacists. Um, you know, pharmacists have to travel with the military when they go on uh, rotate when they go on 
deployments. Um, uh, and overseas bases have to have pharmacists. When carrier battle groups get underway, uh, that's literally thousands of people on, on, on the high seas and they have to have a pharmacist with them. And all that. Um, the VA system, the VA hospital system, they feel, I think if they spend $7 billion on uh, prescriptions, it just in the US alone, that's literally millions of prescriptions. Uh, these VA hospital pharmacies look like huge factories with robots going everywhere filling these, these prescriptions. And they, they hire quite a few pharmacists also. Uh, we've got, we've had some pharmacists come out of our program that went into nuclear pharmacy. Uh, you have to know a lot of physics, obviously. So you want to push your students, if they're interested in nuclear pharmacy, pushing to learn in physics. Uh, spec scans, PET scans, uh, diagnostic imaging. Uh, we're basically putting a uh, radioactive radio pharmaceutical into our patients. And then we're looking for the images, the diagnostic images when they come out. We have special the, the spec scans that's to look for that. Uh, these are pharmacists that, that, are, that are early birds. I like to get up at one, two o'clock in the morning. They're going to the nuclear pharmacy. They'll prepare these nuclear uh, radioactive medications that have a half life of like six hours. So that's the reason most of your things like PET scans and, and, and spec scans happen early in the morning. They're scheduled uh, early in the morning at these various hospitals. Uh, I actually teach a class in diagnostic imaging uh, that talks about these along with MRI, CT scans, and some other things. So there are a lot of different opportunities in pharmacy. Uh, drug information, when, when you call the poison hotline, you may be talking to a pharmacist. Uh, geriatrics, home health, we have a lot of the... Uh, Nursing home chains will actually hire pharmacists to round on their patients within the nursing homes. Uh, a lot of them go into pharmacy law. They actually graduate pharmacy school and then they go on into law school after that. Uh, residency and fellowship. So some of the more specialized areas of pharmacy will require your students to actually continue on uh, postgraduate. So where there's, there's postgraduate uh, PGY-1, PGY-2 internships they can get into. Uh, also fellowships, if they're more interested in getting into research, they can get a fellowship. And there's a matching process, just like, just like for MDs uh, and, and other professions for, that they have to match for these particular residencies. So what, would, what, do, what, what do people look for? Obviously, they look for grades. Uh, they look for leadership roles while you were going to pharmacy school. They look at the strength of your recommendations. And a lot of this is once they get on their third year rotations, how were they able to network the people that could get them into these residency programs? Uh, got a lot of different areas for uh, board, board certifications in the area of pharmacy itself. There's about 11 listed here. Uh, you can get those additional uh, abbreviations after your name, those letters after your name. Uh, if your students ask about earning potential, it's a pretty good earning potential. Uh, when you graduate pharmacy school, you're basically going to start in that, that 90 to 100, 110 range and you work your way up from there. Uh, this is showing the percentiles and the annual, the rough annual salaries. This is out of the 2020 uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. So your students may ask about a quality of life. Uh, I think it's a pretty good quality of life. Uh, balanced family, future, and career. A lot of flexibility. Uh, like I said before, around 60% of pharmacists uh, uh, are female. And a lot of them, actually, when they graduate pharmacy school, they they, they want to take a year or two off, maybe start a family and then get into pharmacy. You can do that. Uh, a lot of students or a lot of pharmacists want to go back to school for whatever reason. And, and it's a good career. If you, if you want to take some time off, you can work part time. You can work as a floater pharmacist, work one or two days a week. I know pharmacists that only work on the weekends and they'll work like crazy hours or like 14, 14 hour shifts, but they only work on you know, Friday night, Saturday and Sunday. And they get in there 40 hours that way. And the rest of the week is theirs. They get to do with what they want to. So you have a lot of flexibility as future hours. Uh, we're one of the most trusted professionals. I'm trying to speed things up just a, just a tad here. Uh, and we're visible leaders in the community. I know I'm, I'm involved in a lot of different boards and things like that. So if you have students that are considering pharmacy, uh, what would you recommend to them? Obviously, get them into these STEM programs. Uh, AP biology, AP chemistry courses in high school. I uh, recommend getting a four-year degree. It helps you get into these uh, pharmacy schools. You want to probably av avoid any drug-related charges, especially felonies in high school when you're trying to get into pharmacy school. Uh, work, send them out, work, let them work as a pharmacy tech, uh, get certified as a pharmacy tech. 
see if pharmacy is what they're interested in. Uh, have them shadow a pharmacist. Uh, obviously, we're looking at grades, and we're looking at a lot of different things for pharmacy school applicants. I'm actually on the commissions committee here. Foreign language skills can actually help a little bit. A lot of pharmacy chains will want to, uh, to place pharmacists in areas uh, that may they may need Spanish speakers in a particular area. Uh, here's a link, pharmacy for me, from our uh, American Pharmacy Association uh, that you can give to students to uh, let, let them learn more about the career of pharmacists. Put that. Talk a little bit about our program since I actually went to school here and I'm actually teaching it now for about six years. Uh, we are an accelerated program. There's four pharmacy schools here in Virginia. Uh, but we attract students from this area locally here in the Coalfields of Appalachia, as well as international students. Um, and part of our mission statement is giving back to the community. That's a big part of what we are here at ACP. And again, we have our students actually have to volunteer 100 hours in our community. That could be through uh, blood pressure checks, health fairs. Uh, you know, pharmacists do a lot of, most of your vaccines are actually given by pharmacists. So we do COVID vaccines, flu vaccines, COVID screenings, things like that in the local community. And the students really enjoy that. What does a typical program look like at ACP? Well, the first year is big on science, obviously. We get them intro to pharmacy, and we move them straight into biochem, the organic chemistry, pathophysiology, pharmacology. Uh, we talk a lot about pharmacokinetics, you know, with the, the absorption, distribution, metabolism, elimination. I talk a little bit about over the counter drugs because we are the prescribers of OTC drugs, if you think about it. And drug information, I actually teach a lot in statistics uh, in the first year. In the second year, it's all about clinical. So kidney function, cardiology, lung function, immunology, uh, GI, all those, and how the drugs affect the pathophysiology. Then on the third year, we get the students out getting the hands-on experience. So uh, we have uh, you know, APP rotations. We have eight five-week rotations. We have four that are core rotations we're required to do. Uh, hospital, primary care, or ambulatory care, like a clinic. Uh, we get them in community pharmacy, and we get them in, in a, uh, a medicine rotation also, internal medicine. And after that, it's kind of up to them. Uh, the sky's the limit. Those last four rotations, uh, they get to pick. So if they're, whatever they're interested in, we can try to work with them and get them rotations in those particular areas, you know, be it uh, veterinary, uh, we have students at FDA. We send students to Elmendorf Air Force Base in Alaska. We send students to Hawaii, all over the country. We have uh, sites all over the country we can send students to. Sometimes we get them overseas. We haven't been able to do that the last couple of years, but uh, a lot of times we'll try to get them overseas also. If we can. Uh, real plug, a little plug for ACP here. Again, we're an accelerated program, uh, which gets them out on the job market a year early. Uh, we have a beautiful campus here. Uh, I'm a trail runner, so I love being here in the mountains. Uh, we're pretty much out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we're actually closer to six state capitals than we are to Richmond, Virginia. And we're in Virginia, if you believe that. Uh, small class size, a lot of leadership opportunities here at ACP. And again, we're, we're big on, on serving the medically underserved in our community. Um, how to get started. There's a lot of prerequisites. And these are pretty much standard across uh, most pharmacy schools, uh, you can expect the organic chemistry, the chemistry blocks. You can expect the uh, uh, physiology blocks, anatomy, physiology. You can expect a little bit of physics, a, a little bit of math in there also. Uh, and then once they start this process, they can go ahead and start their application process through farmcast.org and then get their transcripts in. And then we can actually interview either uh, on campus. We try to get them out here on campus if we can. And if not, we can actually do interviews virtually. And that's why most of them are set up right now. And any questions for our class of 2022 during graduation? Thank you so much, Dr. Talbot. That was so informative. Um, I, my, the school that I previously taught at, well, when I first started teaching, I worked at a school that had a pharmacy tech program. Um, and that was a really great opportunity for students to um, prepare for taking the 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 exam the, to be a pharmacy technician. So I think that's really cool. Um, we do have a, another uh, really great question um, and I'll read it. It says, um, they appreciate how you took 30 years on this journey. Um, what advice may you give for educators that may wanna pursue, 
pursue a doctorate degree in the pharmaceutical industry? Well, I know when this school actually started in 2004, I think. And I know that when, when that happened, a lot of, I hate to say that, but a lot of the high school uh, STEM teachers actually went, in, went to pharmacy career. I think we had four or five that first year that actually went here. Um, they all, they've all done excellent. So if you're already you know, teaching at a high school level and you're teaching in the STEM courses, you're teaching in um, uh, you know, chemistry, uh, physics, math, any of, the, any of those fields, technology, uh, you're probably going to do well in pharmacy school. You really are. Um, advice for, and that's the route I took. You know, I had had, I graduated in 1986, and here I am uh, 20 years later taking organic chemistry. So, you know, if you're in, if you're in this, the same situation I was, you know, it, it took me a while to get up to speed on chemistry. So I was, I was getting the, you know, the chemistry for Dummies book and stuff like that, but I did fine in organic chemistry. So that was no problem. But uh, yeah, that would probably be the biggest thing, depending on how long, how long it's been since you've been out of school. But, uh, you know, just start early. Uh, you, can take your, you can take most of your prereqs at night classes or through community college, things like that. That's great. Um, do we have any more questions from our attendees about pharmacy, pharmaceutical sciences, going into school, clinical research, the development journey? <laughs> that means you all did a really great job and were so, so thorough that <laughs> there are no questions. But thank you again uh, to Dr. Talbot and to Dr. Ying. Um, and once again, thank you to our attendees um, for joining us. We appreciate all of our sponsors that um, allow us to hold these events. Um, oh, we do actually have one more question. Um, it says, what skills have you enabled or what skills have enabled you to switch careers so smoothly? I can open that up to, I guess, both of you. Well, I think a, a lot of it, for me, it's been curiosity. And, and I, I think that's the biggest thing for me. You know, I started out, it was all, it was all math and physics. You know, I wanted nuclear this and drive submarines and engineering and everything else. But I've always, my mom was actually a biology teacher, so. Uh, she developed it, and I grew up here in the mountains, so I always had the love of nature. I still do. I hike all, I'm a bird watcher. I hike all the time. I, I trail run, and there was always that pool of biology and, and chemistry a little bit, and then I kind of got burned out on the technology end of it. I hate to say that, but, you know, after, after about seven years in, in computers and IT, I was like, you know, I, I really want to get into healthcare. I love, I love talking to people. Uh, I, thought, I thought maybe that pharmacy was the way to go. I love biology. And so I think a lot of it was just, just having that, that drive to, to that curiosity and that drive to make that change. Uh, maybe I'm unique in the fact that I, I get bored after seven or eight years in a career. I, I don't think I could do anything for 30, 40 years straight. But I don't know. I'm going to say curiosity. Dr. Ying, you want? Well, I, I, I'd echo that. I mean, it sounds like you've you had a, a great career path and, and you've done some, some really, really fascinating things and curiosity just carries everybody through. I think the other thing that um, was really important for me was, um, was actually just sort of like embracing the unknown. And, um, and I'll, I'll have to say that I, constantly like throughout my entire life I'm always finding myself myself in a, a new situation and you just um you you just run with it so it was actually a huge um shift to 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 move from academia to um to the pharma industry even though you would think that from a subject material um standpoint it's not all that different, but just because people are all that different, people are different and priorities and cultures are different. It's just, it's just an adventure. And so it's really fun to, to sort of, um, to embrace it and, you know, share notes with, with people who are going through the same thing that you're doing. And um, I'm checking back with the people who are still, you know, back in academia and um, one of the things that you sort of can realize is that no matter what you do, you can always go back, you can always go forward, 
you can always change. And just um, as long as you're having a great time, just pick great people to work with and um, you'll never go wrong. Beautiful way to end, Dr. Ying. Love that answer. Always learn, always grow, um, can get you far. Thank you again uh, to our wonderful presenters, Dr. Talbot and Dr. Ying. Um, th that was such an informative session. And once again, thank you to our attendees. This event has been recorded and we will uh, notify everyone when the, um, it, the recording is up on our YouTube page. Um, we'll provide you the link if you wanna go back and, and rewatch. We'll also um, try to post the material on our website um, from our two speakers. If you would like to access uh, some of those links that they had in there, just go back and you know review some of the some of the the journeys and the paths. So once again, thank you so much, everybody. I really hope that you enjoyed this event. It was great hosting. Um.